Welcome to this week's Servant's Entrance Prayer Service. Please join us for our opening song. Welcome to our Servants Entrance Community Celebration for the Feast of Christ the King. Let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Sheep, goat, what's the difference? Sheep have wool that must be sheared to keep the animals cooler in the summer. Sheep have tails that go down and usually do not have horns. Sheep have rectangular pupils in their eyes that allow them to see up to 320 degrees around themselves so they can continuously scan for the movement of predators, even while grazing. Sheep have a strong flocking instinct and tend to come together when threatened. They can become very upset when separated from the group. Sheep have good memories, are good at recognizing each other, and form complex social structures within the flock, with the most interactive, friendly sheep becoming the leader that others follow. Sheep prefer learning from each other rather than from personal exploration. Sheep are grazers and eat grasses and clovers that grow low to the ground. Goats, on the other hand, have hair instead of wool. 
their tails go up, and they usually have horns that point up and back. Goats also have rectangular pupils in their eyes, but their range of vision is wider, up to 340 degrees. Goats tend to be more curious and independent. They like to investigate things, climb things, and jump over things. While goats do like to be in the vicinity of others of their kind, they prefer to learn things on their own rather than from other goats. Goats are browsers. They eat leaves, twigs, and shrubs, and they often stand on their hind legs to reach these tasty tidbits rather than remaining in the grazing position like sheep. So which animal is better? Well, from the standpoint of being equipped to survive in their environments, neither is better. Both sheep and goats are built to survive in a particular environment, given a unique set of strengths and weaknesses as a species. Both are intelligent animals in their own way, and each has a place in creation. Which, then, should we aspire to be more like? Should we aspire to be sheep people, to come together when afraid? Should we aspire to have long memories for the faces of other individuals? and distinguish different emotions on the faces of others? Should we have wide peripheral vision, albeit with a few blind spots? Should we keep our noses down and follow the strongest, most talkative members of our group? Should we learn from each other and stick together when threatened? Or should we aspire to be goat people with independent, adventurous spirits? Should we have a wide view with few blind spots? Should we often look up and look for different ways of doing things? Should we be explorers with inexhaustible curiosity and the need to know new things? Should we keep others near, interacting, but not following? Chances are we are each a little bit of sheep and a little bit of goat. Chances are we all have some blind spots. Chances are we all follow sometimes and strike out on our own sometimes. Chances are, we all feel adventurous sometimes and the need to be with the flock at other times. Chances are, that's the way we were made, to survive in our own particular environments with our own unique combinations of strengths and weaknesses. But most certainly, whether feeling mostly sheepish or mostly goat-like, if we were to ba to call out into the storm or the frightening wilderness, our good shepherd would be right there to guide us back to still waters and wide pastures. Let us pray. Shepherd of Israel, your power was revealed when you raised Christ from the dead and seated him in honour at your side. Grant that we may always give you thanks for your immeasurable love and show that gratitude in loving service to all our sisters and brothers. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. For our God says this, It is your God who speaks. I myself will look after and tend my sheep. As a shepherd tends the flock when the sheep have scattered, so I will tend my sheep. I myself will pasture my sheep. I myself will give them rest, says the Most High. The lost I will seek out. The strayed I will bring back. The injured I will bind up. The sick I will heal, shepherding them mightily. As for you, my sheep, says our God, I will judge between one sheep and another, between rams and goats. The Word of God. Thanks be to God.
A Proclamation of Psalm 63. The second reading is a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. But as it is, Christ is now raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Death came through one human being, and in the same way the resurrection of the dead has come through one human being. Just as in our first parents all die, so in Christ will all come to life again, but all of them in their proper order. Christ is the first fruits, and then, after the second coming, those who belong to Christ. After that will come the end, when Christ hands over the reign to God the Creator, having done away with every sovereignty, authority, and power. Christ must reign until God has put all enemies underfoot, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. When finally all has been subjected to Christ, Christ will be subjected to God, who made all things subject to Christ, so that God may be all in all. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. Please rise in body or spirit for the gospel.
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, At the appointed time, the promised one will come in glory, escorted by all the angels of heaven, and will sit upon the royal throne with all the nations assembled below. Then the promised one will separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. The sheep will be placed on the right hand, the goats on the left. The ruler will say to those on the right, Come, you blessed of God, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me, naked, and you clothed me. I was ill, and you comforted me, in prison, and you came to visit me. Then these just will ask, When did we see you hungry, and feed you, or see you thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger, and invite you in, or clothe you in your nakedness? When did we see you ill or in prison and come to visit you? The ruler will answer them, I assure you, every time you did it for the least of my sisters or brothers, you did it for me. Then the ruler will say to those on the left, Out of my sight, you accursed ones into that everlasting fire prepared for the devil and the fallen angels. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you gave me no welcome. Naked and you gave me no clothing. I was ill and in prison and you did not come to comfort me. Then they in turn will ask, When did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or away from home, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and did not take care of you? The answer will come. I assure you, as often as you neglected to do it to one of the least of these, you neglected to do it to me. These will go off to eternal punishment, and the just to eternal life. The good news of salvation. This is one of those scriptures where the good news of salvation can feel rather tricky to find. And even the concept of this whole feast, Christ the King, can seem hard to find a way into. I mean, America was founded on the notion of rejecting kings. And even back in England, where we now have a king for the first time in my lifetime, Sure, there's all of this pomp and circumstance and processions and gold coaches and stuff, but the king himself actually has very little power and doesn't get to do much. So how are we going to understand and make sense of this feast for us today? Well, I did a little bit of digging into its history, and I discovered that Actually, it's a lot newer celebration than I'd realised. The Feast of Christ the King was instituted in 1925 by Pope Pius XI. And he was looking around the world back then, after one war, gearing up for the next, economic uncertainty, seeing the rise of populist leaders, dictators, fascism, communism, atheism. And he figured that 
we needed a reminder to proclaim Christ's kingship as opposed to following the things in our world. And I think even though we're almost 100 years later, those circumstances that Pope Pius was seeing look pretty similar to some of the situations we're in today. So let's see what kind of a king we're being asked to declare our allegiance to. In the other two years of this feast, the gospel readings are taken from the passion story. So we see a king who suffers, a king vulnerable, a king nailed to a cross, a king giving his life. This year, it's a little different, a <laughs> little more complicated, maybe. The first reading, the one from Ezekiel, where it talks about the care of a shepherd with his flock, seeking out those who are lost, binding up those who are injured. That one can resonate as a kind of God we can give our allegiance to. But then you come to the gospel and all of a sudden we're talking about eternal punishment and hellfire and none of which necessarily seems to connect with the God of love and mercy that we know. And as I was reading through this story, through the gospel, I was kind of noting, yes, okay, there have been times when I have done some of these things that are listed as being good stuff for the sheeps. And there have been plenty of times when I've ignored the homeless guy asking for money on the street corner, when I haven't participated in a service project and had other priorities. And so I could be just as easily found with the goats as the Lynns in their book about healing our image of God says, we're kind of all good goats. Um, or as the Lutherans like to say, we are all both sinner and saint. So how are we going to understand this? Richard Rohr reminds us that even with these difficult scripture passages, we always have to read them through the lens of what we know about God. And what we know about God is that it, it, there is infinite forgiveness and mercy and love. In another book by the Lynns, Understanding Difficult Scriptures in a Healing Way, they quote an author, Susan Mack, who <laughs> points out that not 48 hours after hearing Jesus telling them this story in the gospel. These disciples go right on to call Jesus a stranger, deny that they know him, abandon him in prison, naked, probably hungry, thirsty. They do all of these things, not just to Jesus found in the least of these, but to Jesus himself, who they had known and lived with and studied with for the last three years. And yet, after the resurrection, when Jesus appears to them, there's no condemnation. There's no eternal punishment. She points out that in John's gospel, when Jesus meets the disciples after they've been fishing and he's got a fire going by the beach, Jesus doesn't say, oh, here, come and hop on these fiery coals and start your eternal punishment now. He says, come have breakfast. So if this judging and condemning isn't the lens and the understanding we have of God, where does it resonate? And for me, it resonated with myself, right? How easy is it for us to separate people into sheep and goats, to make ourselves the judge of who's right and who's wrong, with us always being on the side of right. Our polarised political society is just one example. The echo chambers on social media, 
the way we talk about things happening in the church. It's, it's everywhere. This human tendency to separate out sheep from goats. But what if the challenge for me today, for us today, is to see even those we would classify as goats as Jesus? To see Jesus in them. You know, in the story in the gospel, the, the both the sheep and the goats were surprised at where they found Jesus, <laughs> hadn't noticed him. Maybe we need to think about where we might be missing seeing Jesus in those that we disagree with, in those that we think are wrong. This journey of synodality that Pope Francis is calling the church to, the whole process has been one of listening with an open heart, even to people that you would disagree with, and starting from the assumption that the Holy Spirit is in them too. Groups like Braver Angels on the political front are trying to do the same thing, to help people of very different political persuasions learn to listen to each other and see the common humanity, the common desire for goodness, to try and listen and assume good intent rather than sending somebody off for eternal punishment and damnation. Saint Ignatius talks a lot about finding God in all things. And that includes people we think are wrong. So by focusing on this, I'm not saying that these corporal works of mercy are feeding the hungry, caring for those in need. I'm not saying they aren't important. Of course they are. And our community has always done a wonderful job with this. You know, we have CCRT, our movers and shakers, the Hope Warming Centre, Aya Korea. We need to continue to support those. And the needs are always especially great this time of year. So I do encourage you to see Jesus in the least of these and get involved and help where you can. But I know sometimes it's too easy for me to lean on that or the work of others and get kind of smug that I'm doing it right and must be among the sheep. So I cannot set myself up as king to make those judgments of others. We are still in scary and unsettling times. So what would it look like to trust in as the feast's full name is, our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. That's pretty big. Terry and I still remind ourselves about a trip that we took out to the desert in Sedona. And the landscape there is amazing. And there are these immense rocks towering up into this blue sky. And it was one of those moments where, for both of us, it just took our breath away at the immensity and scale of the landscape. And it was like, okay, God's that big. <laughs> Terry picked up a little red pebble from the ground. It's like, sometimes you make God this small when in actuality it's Sedona God, Sedona big. As my favourite mystic, Julian of Norwich, likes to say, even though we don't know how, we can trust that God will make all things well, that all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. That is the king we give our allegiance to. Let's take our friendly time. Let us offer our petitions, knowing that God loves us and hears us. 
that the church proclaims the good news of God's reign. Let us pray to the Lord. That wealthy nations seek practical ways to relieve the crushing debt of poorer countries. Let us pray to the Lord. That the hungry be fed, the homeless find haven, the lonely be comforted, and those in prison know true freedom. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who work to relieve the suffering of others, particularly relief workers and volunteers, that they may show God's compassionate care and be strengthened by God's spirit each day. Let us pray to the Lord. For a new appreciation of creation, that we may have gratitude for the beauties of creation and strive to preserve God's handiwork for the good of all the human family. Let us pray to the Lord. For peace in the world and in our time, let us pray to the Lord. And for our own personal intentions, which we hold now in our hearts, And that the members of this community of faith continue to be support and love and family to each other. Let us pray to the Lord. Loving God, shepherd of us all, we are grateful for your love and care. We ask that you hear us, sustain us and support us this day and always, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. me.
Let us pray. Most loving God, we thank you for our calling and for nurturing in each of us a disciple's heart, a heart that rejoices in your promptings, a heart sustained by your spirit, and a heart encouraged by the support and love of our fellow children of God. God, you offer us new beginnings. Fill us with confidence in our work and may our efforts extend beyond the threshold of our homes, out through the servant's entrance to a world so desperately in need of hope and healing. Dream your dream in us, that in this house church, your vision and direction will take shape in us and we will be transformed by your spirit. May your presence in what we do encourage us to dare and may solidarity and togetherness be our strength. We make this prayer in your name with Jesus the Christ and your Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join us for our closing song. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing God's praise, sing Oh, 